Hi, I'm Ryan Dawes, editor of AI News, and I'm here with Ilya Fage, who is the head of AI research at faculty. Um, so, Ilya, you spoke at, on a panel called Fairness in AI, uh, latest developments in AI safety. So can you just give me a quick overview on what you discussed during that session? Uh, sure. Uh, so, um, well, I discussed fairness in, in, in general uh, applied to machine learning and basically split that into uh, what is fairness or bias um, from a more accessible, broad ethical standpoint. Um, uh, and then kind of made that precise by giving a few uh, kind of statistical definitions of fairness that would be applied in different um, in different scenarios. Um, and then uh, just showed how you can use those you know, precise statistical definitions to um, test any old black box machine learning algorithm and then make it fair, um, which 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 you can you can basically do um, uh, in almost all scenarios. Um, and then finally gave um, a, a bit of a, uh, an overview of some of the nuances and you know this is a, this is a subtle problem and I don't want to pretend that you know I've solved it. Um, well, you know we have some good good useful tools um, but I so I, I also discussed some of the nuances that you have to consider um, to, to, to kind of to get these things right meaningfully. Uh, so some research from New York University came out uh, just last week. Uh, I happen to cover it, so make sure you go uh, go read that. A little shout out to myself there. Uh, um, it, and that research basically found that inequality in STEM-based careers, which has been a problem now for, for well, going on for decades, and it's not something that's going to be solved overnight, um, that's already causing algorithmic bi bias. So how can we solve that a lot quicker? Yeah, interesting. Um, so. Uh, well, I'll try to kind of unpick a few things. So, one, I suspect, I suspect it's hard to know if it's a causal link. Just to just to be, since I just gave a talk talking about causation versus correlation in my fairness talk, um, so probably hard to know what the causal link is. But I but I certainly um, expect that uh, that um, the kind of disparity, demographic disparity in STEM, uh, has just ported over essentially wholesale to AI, since that's where a lot of the, the, the talent pipeline comes from. Um, and then, and then uh, uh, so whether or not uh, that is kind of, what the causation is doesn't matter. Um, uh, you might think that that is a, uh, uh, just a, a lack, of, lack of diversity means that people aren't thinking about these problems to the right degree. Um, so, so that's the problem, just to be precise. Um, and, and, and then I'd kind of split it up a few ways. So the issue in STEM, um, I, I don't think is a problem for the AI community, of course, but but it you know is, is a very general uh, 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 problem that to some degree, um, if you could uh, get that kind of the, the demographic in STEM closer to maybe what the like what the right answer should be, um, then uh, that will just knock right on to AI, um, uh, as well as other engineering jobs and, and, and so on. So that's a problem on its own. Um, whether or not there is a kind of a change in the funnel um, uh, between STEM and between the AI community, um, I don't know. So I, I don't know if um, if STEM is less, it has more disparity or less disparity than like the tech tech industry or, or AI. Um, we keep track of, of that information when we think about our hiring to make sure that we're at least doing better than the funnel. Um, uh, so that's something to, to pay attention to. And that's kind of an easy place to, to, to look because it's basically your fault if not. Um, uh, and then finally within within uh, within the tech community or within within AI, let's say, um, I think the most important thing to do is for organizations and teams, whatever their demographic, you know, breakdown is, um, to just uh, spend more time or, or maybe to have more of a, a onus placed on them to think through what is bias, what is bias in machine learning, um, and how do I make sure that every model we build um, is unbiased? Because it is true that a demographically disparate team can build non-disparate or non-biased tech. So like they should, even if they currently are disparate, they, they should try to do the right thing, I guess is what I'm saying. Um, so some companies are actually trying to build AIs which will scan algorithms for bias. So do you think that might be a sort of possible solution? Yeah, definitely. Um, I mean, uh, I, I showed you one in my talk. Uh, so so we, we have uh, tests for, uh, you give me an algorithm, you give me a black box algorithm, let's say, just to make it even harder. I have no idea what your algorithm does, but I can give it data input and calculate its output, and I can just tell you how how biased it is um, according to various definitions of bias. Um, and then we can we can go even further and say, um, cool. Now let me 
modify your algorithm, give you back a new fair black box algorithm that is that is unbiased with respect to one of those definitions. Um, that's a great place to start, um, uh, and indeed, well, I can't imagine a scenario where someone uh, should say it's better to do nothing than to do that. Um, so, so, so indeed, I, I think there's kind of a lot of promise there. Um, there are challenges, which I talked about in my talk. For example, uh, it's hard to know what definition of fairness to apply. Um, so even if I have some tech that just makes my algorithm fair, I don't know what fair I should use. Um, and there are subtleties with like the causal mechanisms of, of fairness where you actually might not care about fairness overall, you might care about a subset of fairness. Um, and I gave the example in my talk about admissions to university where you don't actually want gender, well, it depends what you want, but fairness doesn't necessarily mean gender parity at the overall admissions. You might want, um, or, or admission rate parity, I should say, you might want admission rate parity at the department level and then allow different genders to decide what apartments to, to apply to because you don't want to take that freedom away from those people. So so, so it can be subtle. So it, those black box tools are a great starting place and like we're developing them, of course I think that. Um, and there's a lot of nuance to building those well, but there's still nuance left over even if you have them. Uh, so in the West we've at least historically considered ourselves quite progressive. Um, do you think that there are some sort of regional uh, issues, like obviously when it comes to human rights in general, um, like there's certain regions which aren't exactly great with women's rights, and um, when it comes to personal privacy, when it comes to things like surveillance, do you think some regions won't take this issue as seriously as others? Um, yeah, it's, it's a interesting question. Uh, definitely, uh, in some sense, it's not clear that some region, regions will take the issue more or less seriously. It's that they have different, well, maybe it's being too generous to say different morality, um, but they, they, they have different, let's say, preferences. So I suspect China takes surveillance and uh, facial recognition very seriously, more seriously than the UK, for example. Um, but they, they, they do so in order to um, in order to leverage surveillance for basically mass surveillance to um, be able to kind of, well, I don't know how contro controversial of a statement this is, but you know, have more co population control. Um, and the UK is certainly trying to walk a fine line of efficiently using that very useful technology, facial recognition, um, but not undermining you know, personal freedom and, and privacy of individuals. Um, so everyone's taking it seriously in that scenario, at least. Um, they are just doing very different things. Um, and indeed, I think there's tons of room for discussion there, but, um, but that is a like, kind of a geopolitical uh, policy question. Um, uh, I can build a good image recognition tool either way, whether or not I'm allowed to use it to, 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 use, to, to um, know which one of my customers are coming into my store, um, it, it, I think is, a, is an open policy question that, 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 that should be discussed and, and I won't consider myself an expert on. Well, a highlight from your talk, at least for me, was when you said that you see AI as an opportunity to reduce some of these societal biases um, rather than a problem. Uh, just because you can control AI in ways that you can control a human bias. Can you sort of elaborate on that point a little bit? Yeah, definitely. Uh, so this this is this is a, a real source of optimism for me. Um, uh, just because human decision making uh, is incredibly biased, and um, uh, and kind of everyone knows that. I did well for the, you know, for 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 this article. Um, I, I should just say we we did a, a you know we did a little experiment in the talk, and I asked people who's worried about machine learning bias, and kind of half the room raised their hand, and then I asked who's worried about human bias in decision making. I was one that put my hand up for both, so okay, fair <laughs> I'm worried about everything basically. Yeah, fair enough. So most of the room raised their hand for the second one. So bias exists in both, uh, and it's you know fairly ubiquitous in both. The difference is you can be precise with machine learning algorithms, so you can just say. Um, this is the objective I'm trying to achieve in my machine learning algorithm. I'm trying to maximize the probability of a candidate being successful at their job um, according to historical people in their jobs. Um, uh, or you can say, um, you can be precise about the data your model's trained on. I'm gonna ignore data from 
before you know this time period because actually things were different back then or whatever. Um, or I'm gonna ignore from this region or I'm gonna ignore this type of data. Um, so you can control what your model uses for information and what it tries to do for objective. Humans have fixed past experiences that they can't control. So I can't change the fact that you know my mom did most of the cooking when I grew up. I can't change that, it's just, and I don't know how it affects my, my decision making. Um, and I also can't really force myself to try to hire people based on success in their jobs, uh, which, I, which I try to do uh, all the time. Um, I, I try to do that, but it's hard to know if I just like had a really, you know, a really great conversation about uh, a person, uh, about, you know, the football uh, with a candidate and therefore think they'll be a great fit um, versus actually they would be good at their jobs. Um, so, faculty is based in Europe, so I take it you guys have had a look at the European Commission's AI, gu AI gu guidelines. Um, what are your thoughts on those? Um, I, I, well, I think, I guess at, at a high level, I think they're great. Um, they, they align uh, quite a bit with how we think about these things. Um, I, I kind of structure, the as I talked about in my talk, the broader AI safety space a little bit differently um, uh, because I think of the AI, well, AI safety problems, I think much more broadly, including kind of more long-term, super intelligent, existential risk, as well as like malicious usages of, of AI. Um, um, but if you zoom into exactly what they're thinking about, they have kind of seven principles. Um, we structure those into three, so we think of uh, kind of fairness, robustness, and explainability. Um, but when you like break it all down, I completely uh, agree at the high level. My biggest um, kind of you know uh, wish, uh, whenever a, a, a kind of a, a, a body like that puts together some some principles or some guidelines, is is um, there's a big gap between uh, that level of guidelines and what is useful for practitioners, and uh, and you know just making those much more precise uh, is is really important. Um, so those weren't you know precise enough by my by my uh, uh, you know uh, standards. Um, um, but not to just abdicate uh, responsibility on policymakers to speak my language, you know, statistics or whatever. Um, I think there's also onus on uh, technical practitioners to uh, to try to articulate. Um, how you can make, you know, for example, in the case of bias, which is one of their principles, um, uh, what bias looks like statistically, um, uh, and you know uh, how that might apply in different problems, and then to say, okay, you know, policy body, which one of these is most relevant, and can you can you now make those statements in this language and kind of just bridge the gap? Uh, so, do you think that companies, perhaps of a certain size, should have to have a oversight board? Uh, yep. It to, so. Uh, to some degree, definitely. Um, I, I suspect that there are cases where you'd want that oversight board to be very external and very like like a regulator um, and kind of a lot of overhead and a lot of teeth. And I would expect there to be cases where that oversight board might be um, just another a team within the organization or, or uh, the team lead or you know just a just an internal body. Um, uh, I, I guess kind of two things to say. One like cute example uh, is that uh, at faculty, we for each one of our project teams, we, the project team has a shadow team, uh, which is another team with basically the same technical skill set, so kind of a set of peers um, who uh, monitor uh, uh, and, and oversee the work done by the project team to make sure that it kind of um, uh, follows, a fair, well, our internal set of values and guidelines, including fairness, as well as just using best practices. Um, so you could do something like that, um, uh, or you could have, you know, like uh, more external, like more overhead oversight. I think the fundamental question here is how to do this in a in a productive way, so ensure AI safety, let's just say in general, um, but that doesn't grind to a halt uh, innovation in AI, um, because you could imagine a scenario where um, the UK takes a really strong oversight stance and then uh, kind of innovation AI within the ecosystem slows down, and then some other country that has much less regulatory oversight, um, their kind of companies become big multinationals and then just operate within the UK, and then you just have a not so well oversighted organization operating within the UK anyway, um, so you've like completely lost lost the, the plot, basically. So. Yeah. Um, so I did speak to a, a digital lawyer quite recently who made that very point, but um, strict regulations that we have in Europe and particularly, especially around things like uh, data collection with GDPR, um, how that strict regulation could put Europe behind competitors such as China, which frankly don't have these kind of regulations, especially when it comes to things like facial recognition. Do you think that Europe will be left behind? Um, yeah, it's an interesting one. Uh, I. 
Uh, it, to some degree, yes, and in some particular uh, kind of aspects, definitely facial recognition, for example. Um, I, I think there's an interesting kind of uh, adjacent uh, question, which is, uh, can your can Europe, and, and maybe it's more useful to just say the UK for, for, for reasons of precision, not politics, um, can the UK become a world leader in AI safety? Um, so that's not quite the question you asked, but I think it's a very interesting one. Um, and I think there are a few reasons why that is, that the answer is yes, and like world leader, not keep up. Um, uh, and the, the reasons are a few, a few fold, maybe uh, kind of three reasons. Roughly, the UK is, is good, uh, is good at AI. Not the best, but good. Um, the, the, the UK is a fairly unobjectionable country with like uh, a fairly respected uh, government. Um, and uh, I say that slightly in jest, but like, you know, the US or China are more objectionable to some set of, uh, of, of, of countries than say the UK is. Another similar country is Canada. So Canada uh, could, could do this as well, leveraging their kind of international position. Um, but then thirdly, the UK naturally uh, has um, kind of fairly uh, involved and, and robust uh, uh, regulatory infrastructure already, especially for like the financial services industry, uh, which is you know very prevalent in London. Um, uh, so some combination of those three things, if that means that you know banks need good AI regulation and regulators in the UK get a little bit ahead of the curve and then the government kind of comes into the conversation and starts to really think carefully and bring in the tech industry to be precise about their, um, about their oversight and regulation kind of policies and there's a good political debate and you get to a point where a set of regulations or, or policies or, or principles can get precise enough to be useful um, that other countries start to adopt them and then UK tech, the tech industry kind of builds up around that. You can actually imagine the UK just be, beating, certainly beating, you know, China and the US, but also beating like, you know, Canada, the rest of, rest of Europe, uh, etc. So yeah, I think it's exciting times. Well, perhaps um, this is where the UK could lead then, and, and where my next question leads into. Do you think the uh, laws should be introduced to protect workers from being replaced by AI? Uh, I mean, my first reaction is, that's a hard question. Uh, and I don't think, um, I certainly don't consider myself an expert. Um, uh, so, so, I, so I don't know. Um, I think I feel like I put you on the spot. <laughs> no, you, well, you certainly did. You certainly did, but I, I guess I would just appeal to the usual, like, long-term question about um, the the labor market being um, being uh, adaptive and you know standards of living increasing. You know, you, you could ask the question a hundred years ago: Should we make sure that automation doesn't come into agriculture because you know ninety percent of the population works in agriculture and a hundred years later agriculture is almost all automated and I don't want to be a farmer um, so I suspect that mo that individuals might be hurt by automation but their children will be better off by mod by automation um, I don't know what the right balance to strike is um, I think like efficient operations of you know companies in the economy slow and steadily raise people's standard of living. Uh, I also think a like fast impulse or a fast change in employment or something will be problematic and should should be taken seriously. Um, but uh, like any kind of heavy handed regulation that like tries to stop automation would probably have unintended consequences that should be thought through well. Brilliant. Well, that's a great place to end. Thank you very much for speaking to me, Ilya. Yeah, thanks Take care.